In the last weeks, we've been bombarded with news about the current COVID-19 pandemic. Although it is highly important that we learn about COVID-19, we might also miss other important stories. A few days ago, for example, a possible breakthrough in HIV research has been reported. As you can see, a man from the UK has possibly become the second person to be cured of HIV. Since we're all under quarantine right now, I want to take this opportunity to talk about this and other possible HIV cures. My name is Gom Steinig and today we talk about HIV and how we might eradicate it from this world. So as always, let's start by discussing some biological background. The human immunodeficiency virus or HIV is the main cause of the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. As the term immunodeficiency in both names suggests, this virus destroys the immune system. But how does this work? HIV is a retrovirus, meaning it wins every dance contest during a disco night. Okay, I thought it was funny some years ago. Retrovirus means that HIV contains an RNA genome, which can be converted into DNA and integrated into the host genome. In other words, retroviruses incorporate their genetic information into our cells. So that might actually sound a bit creepy, but it's not very rare. In the past, ancient retroviruses have infected our genomes over and over again. In fact, over 44% of our DNA contains former virus sequences. So yeah, and if you want some sleepless nights, these virus sequences can also be sometimes reactivated and insert themselves into other genomic regions that are causing different diseases including cystic fibrosis, hemophilia or autoimmune diseases. But let's go one step back and look at the life cycle of HIV. Once HIV has entered the bloodstream, it binds to cells which contain special proteins on the surface, mainly CD4 together with CCR5 or CXCR4. We normally observe high amounts of these proteins on a subtype of T-cells, which are part of the adaptive immune system. After the virus has entered the immune cell, it converts its RNA into DNA. The generated viral DNA can then be integrated into the genome of the host. This is specifically nasty as it might stay in this stage for quite some time, meaning that it cannot be detected by other intact immune cells. In fact, the majority of integrated viral genomes in the host are completely silent. After a while, the virus starts to replicate itself using the machinery of the host cell and then starts to infect other CD4 positive cells. And that's how HIV infections work on a cellular level. HIV infects immune cells, which leads to the gradual destruction of the immune system. However, it takes several years until the immune system becomes more and more ineffective, meaning that AIDS does not fully develop after an HIV infection. Instead, the virus starts to reproduce itself quite quickly in the beginning, but then starts to slow down the infection. We can see this as a very short spike in the total amounts of virus in the bloodstream 8 weeks after the initial infection. At this stage, a patient might experience some clinical symptoms, including headache, joint pain or fever. However, since these symptoms are so flu-like, most patients do not realize that they have been infected with HIV. Then the patient enters clinical latent stage where he does not experience any symptoms whatsoever. Here the virus is present inside T-cells, but does not completely destroy all the infected cells at once. Instead, it slowly starts to shut down the immune system, which in the end causes AIDS. Symptoms of AIDS include recurring fever, weight loss, skin rashes, or also the formation of white spots on the tongue or the mouth. By now, many immune cells have been destroyed by the virus. But HIV itself does actually not cause the death of the patients. Instead, it causes opportunistic infections. Opportunistic infections are infections that normally only occur in people with weakened immune systems. This involves different bacteria, viruses or fungi to which we are all exposed but do not normally become sick. While the body of a healthy individual is normally easily able to fight off these pathogens, many white blood cells in HIV patients have been destroyed at this stage. And as a consequence, patients often die from opportunistic infections. But there are some good news. Today, HIV infections can be largely controlled, meaning that we can keep the number of active viruses in the blood very low. In this regard, we normally use antiretroviral therapies and we can now find different classes of drugs here, all of which block the life cycle of HIV at some stage. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors or NNRTIS, for example, blocks an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. 
Since this enzyme is required to convert the RNA genome of the virus into a DNA genome, NNRTIS can efficiently block the replication of the virus. Another class of drugs is called integrase inhibitors and these medications block, as the name suggests, an enzyme called integrase. Integrase is normally used by the virus in order to integrate its genome into the host genome. Very nice enzyme name here. Although all currently available drugs do not cure a patient from HIV, they keep the number of active viruses inside the blood very low. Okay, so we already have our happy ending. We do not need an HIV cure, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, only 60% of all HIV patients receive appropriate medications. And moreover, these medications also go hand in hand with some complications. You have to think that the patients have to take these medications for the rest of their lives, meaning that the virus has a lot of time to mutate and evolve. As a result, HIV drug resistance might occur, meaning that drugs do not provoke any effects anymore. They might also acquire cross resistance, meaning that they become resistant against a class of drugs and not single drugs. So we need to bring all of our knowledge together in order to get rid of this virus. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, two patients have been cured for HIV so far. So how did that work? Well, in order to answer this question, we just need to know two different facts. First of all, HIV needs the protein CCR5 on the surface of immune cell in order to enter the cell. And some people have a mutation in CCR5, which blocks the entry of the virus. In both reported cases, the HIV patients also suffered from a type of cancer. They themselves were not resistant against HIV, but they received hematopoietic stem cells from donors which were resistant. In the first step, these two patients received a very harsh form of chemotherapy, meaning that all of the stem cells in the bone marrow, which normally constitute all the different components of the blood, were destroyed. Then the patients received hematopoietic stem cells from HIV-resistant donors. These stem cells started to replace the immune system of the HIV patient, meaning that the virus could not spread anymore. So HIV can never reoccur in these patients, right? Well, we think so, but we cannot be entirely sure. The reason is something we've already discussed in this video. Many of our particles remain dormant in the immune cells and they might stay there for quite a long time. However, it seems like that they are cured so far. The complete replacement of the immune system of an HIV patient is also not very feasible on a larger scale, since these two patients were very lucky that a compatible donor was found. Once again, this form of chemotherapy is very harsh and for a short period of time, these two patients did not have any intact immune system. So we need to become more creative and scientists are actually working on other ways to cure HIV. One approach of course would be to block or somehow suppress the function of CCR5 on the surface of infected immune cells. Here we could isolate hematopoietic stem cells from the patient itself and then genetically engineer them using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Yes, I just used the beloved term CRISPR-Cas9 technology and if you're interested in how this works, we've covered it in this video right here. So we could theoretically isolate stem cells from the HIV patient and then make these stem cells HIV resistant. There actually has been a quite similar approach in the CRISPR-Cas9 controversy where two genetically engineered babies were born in China. Here it was reported that CCR5 was mutated before fertilization, meaning that the babies should be HIV resistant, but that's not entirely clear. Lastly, we could also use immunotherapy. Immunotherapy has revolutionized cancer research in the last years. We've already discussed it in this video here, but very briefly, we can reactivate our immune system in order to fight off cancer cells or different types of infections. So our immune system can be compared to a superhero. It is unbelievable mighty, but similar to all the different superhero movie plots, it sometimes needs some assistance to defeat the villain. Inspirational comparison, right? All right, our various clinical trials are currently using immunotherapies to cure HIV. In primates, for example, the semen immunodeficiency virus, which is very similar to the human immunodeficiency virus, has been successfully destroyed by the reactivation of T cells. Over 50% of all treated animals did not exhibit any signs of an infection anymore. So I hope that you've seen it first, HIV patients have been probably cured, and that we are working on other ways in order to eradicate this virus. But what do you think? Would you accept any transplant which contains genetically modified stem cells under any circumstances? I hope that this video improved some minutes of your quarantine time 
And if you're new here on this channel, please subscribe and also hit the bell button in order to stay informed about the latest discoveries in life science. And with that, I'll see ya.